We have got two fantastic presenters this afternoon. Um, I've had the pleasure of present, co-presenting with one of them, so I know you're in for a treat, and just met the second presenter, and he seems to be um, very passionate about this program as well, as we all are. But we've got Jenny Carmody and Janelle Jamerson is here to facilitate this session, and they both bring to the table a vast experience on community coalitions. So they're going to share with us how to employ coalitions as part of building a sustainable imagination library program. So let's give a warm homecoming welcome to Jenny and Janelle. to Kim as my right arm. <laughs> Since my accident, <laughs> Kim has been extraordinary. So in, Kim, I thank you. I just could not have done it. And when this happened, after Kim knew I was okay, the next thing on our mind was, we're getting you to Dollywood. <laughs> so I would not be here without Kim, literally, today. So thank you, Kim. Um, now I'd like to talk and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about how uh, we use imagination libraries to grow and sustain our coalition. So, a little background. From Syracuse, New York, we uh, have made history in Syracuse as the global birthplace of the modern adult literacy movement. That means we had um, Wildbach International, Music Volunteers of America, founded in Syracuse, New York, later merged to become pro-literacy, this, this gigantic, um, there's the organization worldwide. <coughs> what is the ingredient missing? Connecting the dots. And that's what a coalition is all about. So, with the help and really the leadership and vision of the Central New York Community Foundation, our coalition was born. The Literacy Coalition of Onondaga County. Uh, we were founded in uh, 2008. Our vision statement, as you see here, 100% literacy through 100% community engagement. Our mission statement, as that birthplace of the literacy movement, is to collectively build and support community initiatives that improve literacy levels across the lifespan in Onondaga County. Across the lifespan is that whole early childhood. Here, I talk with my hands, but I can't do this. Early <laughs> childhood, school age, workforce, adult education, it's all those components working together. Um, why Imagination Library? We know this program, as I talk to Christy about this, we're on the train. We are passionate about this program um, and believe that it, it not only provides our children this incredible foundation, but it aligns with our work with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. What is the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, you might ask? Um, this is a national movement uh, founded uh, by the Annie Casey Foundation. I believe there's 250 or maybe even 300 communities around the country that are part of the campaign for grade level reading. Um, the, they focus on um, an important predictor of school success and high school graduation, which is grade level reading by the end of third grade. Third grade reading is that pivot between learning to read and reading to learn. And we know that many of our children, especially our low income children, are challenged. We have 89% of the children in the city of Syracuse are not reading at grade level in third grade. So um, this program has provided us a framework to strategically work with our community partners. And that work is in three areas. One is school readiness. We know too many children are not ready for school. Imagination Library, centerpiece of our school readiness strategy. But we also work on chronic absence issues we know too many children do not, are not attending school regularly. Also, summer learning loss. We know too many children are losing academic gain over the summer, especially children in low-income areas. They are the most challenged, and this, you know, they 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 gain they gain academically during the school year, just as their middle-class peers gain. 
but the loss over the summer is just tremendous. So it's these three areas we work within and have been aligned with. So here's a quick snapshot of our efforts um, to date. We have now over 14,000 children enrolled, so they're receiving books month to month. Distributed, like 276,000. Um, 150 community referral partners, key piece. We could not do this alone. Um, we, we enroll at community events. We enroll at different, different kind of um, sponsored events. But really the bread and butter of our efforts is our referral partners. <coughs> Basically a referral partner is anyone that <coughs> we've identified that provides any support or any support or services to families with children zero to five. We find anyone in that bracket, you're a referral partner. It can be a hospital, so you can have you know big partners. It can be a church. Doesn't matter. If you're providing services with that, that target group, you're one of our partners. Um, we have incredible partners. Our county is very much engaged. Our county department of family services, county health department. Each of our birth, we have three birthing, birthing hospitals in our community. They're all enrolling too for us. But it's, it's Head Start, it's Catholic Charities, it's United Way, it's Salvation Army. All those organizations together working towards our outcome. And family nursing program, and I'll be talking about our programming a little bit later, but we've engaged um, just over 3,000 families in um, ongoing family nursing programming, and that's targeted in the city of Syracuse. So, just quickly, over the years, we launched Imagination Library in 2010 to a small area. We've had research done, and I'll talk a little bit about that next. And then we've also been fortunate to be a named um, pay setter um, or received pay setter honors by the campaign for grade level reading on several occasions and most recently we've been named a finalist in the all american city award process so number one so what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to give you some highlights of our efforts and i there's number one highlight is our research team we had received a um, long-term commitment from lemoyne college to assist us in evaluation of our efforts and this picture here shows that lead team up at Lemoyne. But in particular, you folks might have seen or know Frank Ritzy. Dr. Frank Ritzy is uh, the professor of sociology at Lemoyne, but he also is the vice president for community investment at the Central New York Community Foundation. As I said, they were instrumental in the coalition being founded and instrumental in us launching Imagination Library. So it's with the efforts of that team in conjunction with our measurement action team. We had, um, we started, so September 2008, on, and, and in October 2008, we started, we had our first measurement action team meeting. That was our very first group we convened. And since that time, we've pulled in anyone in the community that I go to a meeting and I hear a data geek, and I adore data geeks, but if I hear anyone at a meeting that really is into data, we pull them in. We pull them in, and um, that's been a team that's been meeting um, regularly since we since we um, started the coalition. So I talked a little bit about some of our research, and I can uh, there are links to this on our website, and I'll be glad to talk about it afterwards. But the, but the previous research, um, the research that has been done and published um, is some qualitative and quantitative. Um, so the initial research, which was then published in Reading Psychology, um, is associating longer enrollment imagination library associated with more child-directed reading and story discussions, and that was controlling for um, child's age, gender, income, and so on. So that was really our first foray into the research um, that was peer-reviewed, and then the next, we uh, really wanted to look at refugee families. We work closely with our Catholic Charities and Salvation Army, and, I'm sorry, Catholic Charities and Interfaith Works. There are two refugee um, um, support agencies in our community. And uh, we, in particular, wanted to see what kind of penetration the book delivery system had uh, for those families. And again, that was some great results with parents reporting more reading associated with those books in the house, as well as that modeling of shared reading. That was really an important component 
especially for those that entered our country and maybe they did not come here with any culture of, of literacy, of family time together. So that report was um, published in the Early Childhood Journal. Um, so the latest research, and this was exciting because we finally had a large enough cohort of children that were in our program from birth, but now we're entering kindergarten. Yay, right, so this was, this was interesting because it found that those children who were consistently participating in the Imagination Library were better prepared to enter kindergarten than their non-participating peers by nearly 30%. So this was uh, peer-reviewed um, based on our program that has been accepted for publication in the Applied Social Sciences um, Journal. So why that is really amazing is that look at this just this slide about um, the percentage of children being ready for kindergarten, and you see that that consistent enrollment. And that's another thing interesting. I mean, we know that <coughs> just one book isn't a silver bullet. So it looks like, and this is what Frank Ritzy will tell you, it's not our research in isolation at all. It's looking at the body of research, which was discussed earlier. If you look at all the pieces put together, and what's interesting is that it's teasing out that there has to be a, it looks like about a three year time frame. It's when it would, it would make sense to be a point where that's the optimal time that a child would, be, would benefit from this program. So what this looked at was that consistent enrollment between three and four years. And that was associated with children performing above our county average, uh, while non-enrollments were below the county average. So um, that was significant. And um, the work of our measurement action team continues. They're looking at a variety of other components to our work, and um, maybe we'll report on that <laughs> at another time. So, number two, stories of the season. Why well, I wanted to bring this up uh, for two reasons. One is, it's always important, and we know that, to raise awareness about our efforts, have community-wide efforts, community-wide ways to engage parents. Okay, wonderful. We have some great examples of that. But this reminds me to, to say this now is that I also use stories of the seasons to engage funders. When I sit down with a funder, they don't, they don't always buy into, I mean, they get Imagination Library, but they don't, always, they don't always make that connection of, okay, great, I'll give you money to that. I find that I need to present a menu of options for them, and stories of the seasons gives me a menu of options. Because when I talk to a funder, I already <coughs> have determined that Early childhood is their interest. Okay, number one, we got to do that. And if people are not, it's like they just thank you very much and you kind of move on. But you got to look for people that that's their, you know, that's what they want to support. Then when I sit down, I say, so what do you think you want? Do you, what what kind of programs might you be interested in supporting? Might it be Imagination Library for all the wonderful things that we know about Imagination Library, or might it be to support the coalition in and of itself? Because that's something that you can promote, right? We need to support ourselves and we need to operate. But I also then provide them with options for underwriting some seasonal events. We had an event this winter, which was um, uh, called the um, Bedtime Story with Daniel Tiger. So we had Daniel Tiger there. Who knew that Daniel Tiger was this rock star? <laughs> it was unbelievable. Well, we, thought, we, thought it, we, we had this event at the at regional mall it's called Destiny USA. We thought if we had 500 attending, that would be incredible. We had over 1,500 attending. It was, it was a rock concert with baby strollers. <laughs> Unbelievable. And then we, um, we didn't ask those families how many are enrolled in Imagination Library. Unbelievable hands that went up. Incredible. So I have other writers for that event. We also are having, we had a Read Across America Day. Uh, event which we always have on Dr. Seuss's birthday and that was really nice because and that's what the picture is about we had refugee families at our zoo our county executive was there and we had books for the families to read along with the book being read so that was as if I'd like to say the, the Daniel Tiger was the quantity of that like big time crazy event this was smaller maybe about 75 attending but the quality was so lovely and wonderful so that was springtime. Summer, we're planning a dive into, um, dive into summer with splash and bubbles. 
Flash and Bubble is the latest PBS characters. Jim Henson's company developed that. So we're having a summer learning event with an ocean theme to it. That makes sense, right? Ocean theme, summer, and water. We don't call events family literacy programming events. We don't say, we don't call them summer learning events. We call them dive into summer with Flash and Bubbles or bedtime with Daniel Tiger. So we're learning how to, how to market our efforts and um, uh, Stories of the Seasons is that package that we're working on and we promote the themes of school readiness, school attendance, and summer learning. Literacy Champions. So, again, with the support of the Central New York Community Foundation, uh, they've always wanted to, and of course we support that, to um, encourage families to engage in programming and to um, um, encourage more community partners to engage their families in a wide variety of events and programming. So we've had this Literacy Champion grant program now for the past six years. It's about 50000 a year, so we now have awarded over $350,000. And this is for organizations like the zoo. Our zoo comes in and does programming with families. So not only do they bring an animal to a, to a, a, a partner, but they'll bring a book about that animal. Or they'll bring, actually not a book about the animal, more like flight. So say they want to talk about flight, we'll bring a book around that theme, we'll bring in biofacts, so some wings and things that children can touch, and at the end, they'll have a bird. So it's a wonderful package. But we have our, our local uh, public television station has programming, we have programming with our refugee families, with Salvation Army and Head Start and, and some of the partners I've mentioned. So um, that is a real uh, special and um, I, think, I think very compelling component of our efforts too, to further leverage the impact of these books being delivered in our community. Um, oh, what are we saying? So, our community, um, there's, a, there's a newly developed organization in our community called um, Early Childhood Alliance. Early Childhood Alliance, I think what really brings to the table and really complements our efforts is that they're looking at health outcomes. We, of course, we're, we're all in with educational outcomes. But to have an organization, and they've really helped us broaden um, the partnerships countywide too, looking at developmentally, are children screened at birth? How are they progressing? What supports for pregnant um, parents? So there's so much that the Early Childhood Alliance is bringing to the table. And what they have launched last month is Talking <coughs> is Teaching, Talk, Read, Sing, which is a national campaign that I believe we're the 12th community in the country to join Talk, Read, Sing. And of course, it's this uh, community-wide messaging campaign about Talk, Read, Sing. And it is, um, further leverages our community's investment in Imagination Library. <clears throat> Five. I wanted a slide to talk about adult literacy, and I'm so glad someone earlier talked about some of the materials being appropriate for low literacy, low literate adults, because that we know there's a connection between parents and their children. And if you want to help children, you also need to connect and invest in adult literacy. And I just wanted to, to read something, if you bear with me, about that. So, a large portion of our country's children are raised by parents who, can ha who have little or no literacy skills. Low literacy can affect individuals and families in many ways, including living, living in poverty, struggling with health problems, facing financial distress, and technolo technological isolation. One of the most worrisome results of low adult literacy, however, is its impact on future generations. Evidence continually surfaces to suggest that parents' education has a significant impact on children's academic performance. What I, 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 I'd like to do is challenge all of you to make sure you connect with the adult literacy providers in your community. I'm sure you think it's natural to make sure, yeah, make sure Head Start is there. Make sure all the early childhood providers are connected to your efforts. But it is as important to connect with the adult education providers as well. It's really a dual generation strategy. We can't have impact on a baby if we're not also connecting with the needs of that mother or father. So, um, very important. Next, communication. There is, there is nothing as important as getting the word out about what we're doing. And I'm just telling someone at lunch, if we don't tell people what we're doing, they'll assume we're doing nothing. So we need to get our word out on as many platforms as we possibly can about all our efforts. 
We have an e-news, an electronic newsletter that goes out via constant contact. We have over 10,000 email contacts on that. So we not only send out an e-news, but I send out targeted messages. That way too, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and you know, we, we're just doing, I mean, always trying something else. The only way, I, mean, I am so not an expert in all these things, but I'm, I jump into the deep end of the pool. I'm in. And always trying something new. Like I've seen somebody did a photo contest. I'm like, I can do a photo contest. How do you do that? So figured out how I did that. So I launched um, something we just, last week, I do a photo contest for summer learning. So it's for our Imagination Library families. I just wanted to wait, send us photos of ways that you're interacting with children and books over the summer. And it's also a way, I wanted to up, I'm really close to having a thousand likes. So you know, you can always like my website because then we get, I'm gonna get over a thousand for some reason, I really wanna hit that. <laughs> so I thought if I did this, this contest, part of the eligibility would be, okay, you gotta be enrolled in Imagination Library, right, check. You gotta like the Facebook page. So just, you know, you just try something new. And I think that it, it really is something that um, we all need to do is, is get the word out there about our program. So that all, that, that will pay dividends in so many ways. Challenge grant. Again, thank you, Central New York Community Foundation. We would not be able to operate without the long-term financial support of Central New York Community Foundation. They put the seventh straight year. They have helped us reach, so they issued a challenge, they've issued a challenge grant every year of $50,000. We have to match that with another $50,000. As such, that's 100000 in administrative operating monies, which is incredible. Um, so it's a tribute certainly to the community foundation, but also to our community partners, because we need both in order to do that, and then we can operate. Uh, finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, collective impact versus collaboration. So there's a growing body of research about the value of collective impact. And I have uh, the chart that talks about the five conditions of collective impact. And we really endeavor to um, um, proceed and, and connect with all those different areas. Common agenda, shared management, measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, backbone support, we're the backbone organization. But I wanted to, um, again, bear with me because I wanted to read something. It's important to distinguish between collective impact and collaboration um, because I know we all, we are collaborating one way or another, but we really need to move to collective impact to make a difference in our community. So, just to show you some distinctions. <laughs> program outcomes versus, uh, program versus outcomes. So rather than organizing around programs or initiatives, collective impact organizes stakeholders around shared outcomes and the ones that can be reported regularly. Two, prove versus improve. Operators often use data to prove things. Collective impact is focused on using data to make improvements in real time. It is critical that players disaggregate data to look for trends, identify what works or doesn't for different neighborhoods, races, classes, cultures, and so on. Uh, three, do more versus work better. Collaborators may be asked to take on additional tasks. Collective impact involves using data <coughs> to help you improve your current work, leveraging existing assets, and building a culture of continual improvement. And then last, and number four here, is importing ideas versus engaging the community. Collaborators offer, often introduce ideas from other communities. Collective impact involves identifying and advocating for what works in your community. Successful collective impact efforts engage community expertise and learn from it. So why does this all matter? Because our country is program rich and system poor. Not coordinated, not targeted at getting individual children the resources they need to thrive. There's billions of dollars invested in K-12 education, which is still not resulting in consistently better results for our children. A collective impact, uh, therefore, was born from the realization, like things, that it will take something different to achieve results at scale. Um, <coughs> challenge to all of us. And then finally, I do want to give a nod 
to um, our county. Um, unfortunately, our county executive, Joni Mahoney, is not going to be able to join us tomorrow. Um, Ann Rooney will be here in her place. Ann Rooney is our deputy county executive for human services, who is also extraordinary, so we'll have a great time with Ann tomorrow. Um, but last week, the New York State um, Early Care and Learning Council um, had presented their 18th Annual Excellence and Leadership Award to County Executive Joni Mahoney for her significant contributions to New York's children. Um, as I was telling someone uh, just the other day about our County Executive, she's the first person I heard, this is when we launched Imagination Library, the first person I heard that was talking about the connection between early childhood and economic development in the same conversation. And that's pretty extraordinary. She's been consistent in that regard over the years. So we thank her, we thank Ann, and before I end, I want to, because I'm thanking everybody that comes from Syracuse, we have Rich Gazarowski and Justin Zales. You're also here from Syracuse, also part of the county government. Um, we, it's all about connecting, connecting the dots, connecting our partners. We could not do this without our partners. We could not do this without having engaged partners at the table from day one. From day one, and your partners come and go too. You'll have new, new executive directors or new presidents of organizations. But there is there is a value <coughs> to working as a community, and clearly a value to pursuing a collective impact um, um, strategy going forward. So with that, that's it. <laughs> Good uh, afternoon, everyone. If you could give me a moment, I'm going to queue up the presentation here. <coughs> Great. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Great afternoon. Again, I am Janelle Jamerson, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the executive director of the Flint and Genesee Literacy Network in Flint, Michigan. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Um, and so I, uh, first, I just want to start uh, just with an ode uh, to Jamie. I was sharing with her when she uh, came in. We started our coalition in September of 2014, and the consultants that we worked with at the time, Literacy Powerline, uh, told us that if, we, if you can really just get to where Syracuse is, <laughs> you will be a strong coalition, um, and so I'm always excited to be able to, uh, to share space with Jenny and really just benefit from the uh, deep level of expertise uh, that, they, that they're building um, in Syracuse. And her last comments are, are really just transitions very well right into um, this session. Like I said, the Literacy Network began in September 2014, um, and we are a coalition of cross-sector partners who have committed to radically and permanently improving life outcomes for our community's most vulnerable learners. We believe that literacy um, is a method that can be used across multiple domains to do that. Um, and so in, in the uh, whole frame of that, again, starting in 2014, launching our Imagination Library Initiative just uh, this, well, just past, in this past October, our conversations locally are really about going from scope to scale. Um, and so that, this is really how we'll focus uh, the presentation. So when we're talking about scope, what we're talking about is the big picture. Everyone say the big picture. The big picture. Okay. The big picture? The big picture. Absolutely. So when we're talking about scope, we're talking about really what is it that we want to do. Um, where is it that we want to go and how is it that we actually plan to get there. But in order to really understand scope in our community, we really uh, are married to the principle of falling in love with the problem. Right, falling in love with the problem. And a lot of times when we work, we'll acknowledge a problem, right? But we won't necessarily do the hard work of understanding what's happening in our community that's contributing to this problem and what do we need to do as a community of partners to address it. This is what we knew um, about Flint and Genesee County when we first began this work. We knew that, uh, that as related to uh, children living in poverty, third grade reading proficiency, adults without high school diplomas, and adults like lacking basic skills, that there were significant disparities between children and families in Flint and Genesee County and those in the state of Michigan, those in the United States overall. 
And so you see here, as it relates to children living in poverty, Flint would be the purple bar. So we see in relation to the United States, in relation to the state of Michigan, in relation to the county, there's substantially more children in the city of Flint, somewhere to the tune of 42% of all children living in the city of Flint under 18 um, are living in poverty. And as it relates to third grade reading proficiency, same thing. We see that, uh, I think, it, I can't remember the exact number, I don't have my notes here, but there's somewhere to the tune of 24% of children in Flint and in, in the city of Flint schools are proficient in third grade reading. And then we have county data on adults without high school diplomas, about 10% in the county, and about 10% uh, of adults lack, lacking basic skills. Our work was originally um, incited by a 2013 report from the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce that told us that 51% of adults in our community would need improved basic skills to meet the demands of our current workforce. Why is this all important to the Imagination Library? When we're talking about children, I'm so glad that Jimmy said this. When we talk about children, especially children in early childhood, there's no <coughs> three-year-old who wakes themselves up bathes themselves and walks themselves to head start, right? There's not a three-year-old that you will meet who will do it, right? That three-year-old is attached to a caring adult somewhere, be it a parent, a caregiver, a grandparent, a neighbor. And so when we see the disparities in adult gains, and we put those against the gains in children, we see that it might not necessarily be causational by looking at it, but it's a strong correlation. And so in our scope, again, understanding what's the big picture, we understood that if we were going to move forward and make a population level change for our community, that we had to focus on a two-generational approach. So we push our community members in our conversations that we don't talk about parents without children. We don't talk about children without parents. And this really helped in developing um, the scope of our work. One of our major commitments is that we're building a system. I love what Jimmy said, that, that, that education is programmed rich and system deficient, right? So we're building systems based on solutions, not programs. What our partners have come together in Clinton Genesee County and said is that when children are born in our community, they should be supported by high quality early learning. That they should be enriched through book rich environments and that their parents should receive high quality parent education. That as early as preschool, that they are able to engage in high quality out of school time learning experiences. And when they start school, that they have the opportunity to be supported academically and socio-emotionally, and that those same supports continue throughout the life spectrum on the adult end, focusing on soft skills for workforce engagement. And finally, that we're able to begin to start engaging with our young people as early as eighth grade on real uh, hardline tasks on workforce training and engagement, uh, focused on post-secondary readiness, access, and finally, success. So we have scope, and let me just go back. You see the bolded areas here, quality early learning, book rich environments, parent education, and out of school time learning. These are the four areas in our continuum of solutions that the Imagination Library touches daily, right? And so we have our scope now. Um, and now our conversations are really about how do we move to scale. So scope again is? Big, big, big picture. Absolutely, scope is the big picture, so scale is big enough to make a difference. Right? And so a lot of times when we're talking about issues, a lot of times deeply rooted community issues, we can find solutions, but our, but our solutions are not commensurate to the scale of the problem. Right? We can find a solution, but our solutions are not commensurate to the scale of the problem. So once we've identified that we have a community issue, um, we have to really start thinking about how we move this to actually impact at the scale that we need it to make. And this pipeline, uh, was adapted from the Promise Neighborhoods Developmental Pathway for Achieving uh, Community Results. But I think that this pathway is really relevant as it relates to how our community's imagination library has um, grown. So we'll start really with stage one, which is planning. And planning um, is a space where we rally stakeholders, where we build consensus and, stab and establish a common agenda. You heard that in the Collective Impact Report and then we pilot strategies. In early implementation, we began to implement collaborative strategies. We connected a cohort of children and families to needed services. We began to display performance data, and we also began as a group of partners to work to build clarity on the aspects of our solution. We're right now at the end of our early implementation work, and we're moving with a full focus now into full implementation. What that means is that 50% of the targeted children and families are connected to collaborative strategies. 
that partners are piloting individual strategies within their solution areas. We'll talk about that. And then performance data informs the solution refinement. Now we're looking at the outcomes of our work every single, uh, at, at every reporting period, be it monthly, quarterly, or annually. And we're using that information to refine our work. Then we move to reaching scale, where we're touching at least 65% of our targeted children and families. Families are experiencing better results as a result of their connection, and we're using a data-driven improvement process to uh, ensure effectiveness. And we know that we're able to sustain those results when our partners um, are, when, our, when our partners are then taking partner and collaborative solutions and integrating them into their regular practices and funding. Where children and families are experiencing markedly better results, and we're still using that data-driven improvement process as a part of our community's culture. So that's kind of a high level of the developmental pathway. But the thing that I love about this is that the bar where it says results being achieved, right? You see that it starts very light on the planning end. It becomes darker as it moves closer to sustaining results. This is a very important expectation in our work on making community-wide population level changes. When we go into a planning process, we cannot expect that the outcome of the plan, the plan itself, will change to the outcomes for families. The plan gives you scope or big absolutely. Picture. So the plan gives you the big picture, absolutely. But then what we have to do as partners with the plan is start talking about how to get to scale, which is big enough to make it a Absolutely. So here we go. <laughs> so there it is, big enough to make a difference. So under our planning process, and again up top here, you see that our goal um, is to increase the percentage of Flint children accessing age-appropriate reading material. Right? This is our goal as a coalition. We want to see more Flint children access age-appropriate reading material. So we started in planning. How do we get more children to access age-appropriate reading material? We see that these are the kind of conditions of planning, rallying stakeholders, building a common agenda, getting consensus on solutions, and then piloting at least a strategy. But one of the principles that we work by in rallying stakeholders is if you don't have a contribution, you should not be at the table. If you don't have a contribution, you should not be at the table. Now, this does not mean that we don't want people to be at the table, but when we are pulling partners together, we're pulling partners together <coughs> toward an outcome for children and families. And so sometimes you'll see that partners will come to the table wanting to see how they fit, but it can sometimes pull your meetings down, right? And so what we do as a backbone organization is work with our partners intentionally and strategically to understand how do they best fit and how can they best support. Some partners might not know up front, and that's fine. It's just not the space for them at that moment, right? The other thing in the planning process is, is to focus on the goal. We did not go into our conversation saying that we want the Imagination Library. In fact, I did not know about the Imagination Library until earlier last year. We went into our conversation saying that we want children to enter kindergarten ready to learn. And we believe that a solution in that regard would be to make sure that children are enriched by book-rich environments. And so our initial conversation, we had to get started. So our local partner, the Flint Public Library, they had a board member who wanted to put a bookshelf in his barbershop. And the library mentioned that they were doing this at our planning meeting, and the group of partners decided to collectively support that. Right? So they began talking about what can we know from this bookshelf being there. They created some performance measures. Right? And we began working off of that one bookshelf. From six uh, months of, of, of implementing that pilot, we began to move into early implementation. Again, we moved from these individual strategies being piloted to collaborative strategies being piloted based on available resources. Performance measures began being used to demonstrate outcomes. We began to connect more children and families to needed services. And we began to make clarity about the scale, the scale, the scale uh, for each solution um, in that area. So, one of the first things that we recognize about those bookshelves being in the barbershop is that we were ignoring the child's first and most important teacher. Parents. Parents. Absolutely. So we knew that if our work was going to be able to be sustainable long term, we had to invest in the capacity of the parent. So we launched a collaborative initiative using the Every Child Ready to Read um, at Your Library curriculum. Um, and so these were parent caregiver workshops focused on children and their parents. It was collaborative between our county library, <laughs> our city library, the local university, the county school district, and the city school district, all pulling their parents together. 
He added a librarian to the barbershop books initiative. So now there's a librarian who goes around to each one of those sites, updates the, updates the bookshelves, fills in books where they're missing, but then also makes sure that culturally appropriate material are uh, located on those bookshelves depending on their locale. He also added eight additional sites. And so we began looking at local data, seeing where there was high concentrations of poverty, seeing where there were regular places where families and our target populations regularly waited. We began building partnerships with the individuals who had a role to play in making a difference. Now remember, when we were here, we said if you don't have a contribution, you shouldn't be in the room. In a planning process, a barber might not have seen their space in the room. Would you agree? We say, community, we want children to enter kindergarten ready. Usually the barbers aren't the ones who raise their hands and say, we're the ones who have a role to play in making a difference. But as we began building clarity around the components of our work, it became very, very clear that our barbers and other people who manage regular waiting spaces were partners who had a very, very strong role to play in making a difference. So we expanded to eight sites, or to eight additional sites. We began to implement site-wide performance data, focused mostly on how much and how well information. So looking at the quantity of our efforts and the quality of our efforts, right? And then lastly, um, our partners agreed that our response was not big enough to make a difference. Even with eight bookshelves in barbershops across the community, even with these random workshops going on across the community, is great. We're seeing improved results in, uh, in behavior and attitude and circumstance and knowledge of, in a small group of maybe 50 families. We're talking about 9,500 children in our community between the ages of zero and five. 50 is a drop in the bucket, right? And so when our conversation is focused on, yes, we understand the problem, but now we have to make our solution big enough to make a difference. We looked at a number of different ways, a number of different opportunities, but the Imagination Library for us was a platform and infrastructure that we could build around as a community. The thing I love about collective impact is exactly what Jenny said, that when people are collaborating, you look outside, you try to pull things in, or when you really focus on improving life outcomes for the children and families <coughs> in your individual community. Only you and your community knows it well enough to create a response that's actually big enough to make a difference. So we knew that with the Valley Park Imagination Library, we would be able to get books to children in our community. Right? And we know that by merely accessing the book, it's a change in circumstance. But our conversation and looking at our people better off, we look at the acronym is BACKS, B-A-C-K-S. We look at changes in behavior, changes in attitude, change in circumstance, change in knowledge, change in skills. Right? So we knew that the book going out and getting into the home is a change in circumstance. Right? So just by, the, by, just by way of the child receiving the book, it's a better off uh, opportunity. But how do we really get to the change in knowledge, the change in behavior, and the change in skill? And that's really where we focus the Flint Kids Read Initiative. So this group of partners have been collaborating since we put the first bookshelf in barbershop. And so when those partners came together on how do we scale, we called our community foundation. We said, you have a role in our community as a convener, right? And we need you to pull partners together who have a role to play in making a difference. From this list of partners here, the Community Foundation, the Foundation for Flint, the Literacy Network, Flint Community Schools, Hurley Hospital, Michigan State University, University of Michigan. You never get Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. Okay? But Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, Flint, United Way of Genesee County, we pulled these partners together. Okay? And these partners collectively decided that the Flint, that the Flint Public Library should be the local champion. This is the power of collective impact. We were asking our community foundation for funding to serve 65% of all children left to five in Flint Jesse County, right? These are not small dollars that would be being raised for the local champion. But these partners, based off of the structure of the program, were able to say that the Flint Public Library, even though they all could have managed the program, would be the strongest to manage the Imagination Library. But then our conversations went further. If the book goes out, is it big enough to make a difference? No, so what are we going to do as a set of local partners to make sure that we can get to that change in behavior, change in attitude, change in knowledge, change in skills? And we created Flint Kids Read. And Flint Kids Read is a, um, a community-based initiative really managed by the local intermediate school district. But it does these things. It integrates the Imagination Library resources into the Head Start Family Engagement Framework. 
So now through all early Head Starts and Head Start, we're now creating local resources that mirror the, the Valley Park Imagination Library books that creates this consistent culture across those who are enrolled um, in early learning. Through the Flint Kids Read Initiative, we'll be implementing community-based literacy activities targeting families in public and low-income housing. When we talk about disparities um, amongst people, we always say that those who are from low-income families um, are the hardest to reach. I always struggle with this, right? That people, the low-income families are hardest to reach. Because low-income families have low-income housing developments, right? Low-income communities. I mean, it's so clear where they are, it's hard to reach because our arms either aren't long enough or they're not in the space, right? And so for us with Flint Kids Read, we want our partners to intentionally target families that are in public and low-income housing. So we're talking about that 50% of targeted families. We will know that we're at scale when 50%, or we're reaching scale, when 50% of all families in public and low-income housing are enrolled in the Imagination Library and are benefiting from Flint Kids Read resources. The Flint Kids Read Initiative supports the ongoing enrollment and partner technical assistance through a Flint Kids Read coordinator. So the Flint Kids Read coordinator is housed in the Department of Early Learning at the Genesee Intermediate School District, but they also work with a set of literacy coaches. So these coaches will be doing enrollment uh, with families at hospitals, so uh, as part of a newborn baby bundle. They'll also be doing technical assistance for our partners who need the capacity build to support parents. Again, there are a lot of people who work with children, and usually the work with parents is holding a parent night or sending out a flyer. This is a new capacity bill when you're looking to create the space for the parent to actually be the first and most important teacher. And that's what those literacy coaches are for. And then finally, um, Flint Kids Read helps us to spread best and next practices. Um, like uh, Jenny said, collective impact, global, global collaboration, it's easy to spread, to spread best practices. And best practice is a good thing that happened in the community and they were smart enough to put it out to everyone else, right? And we all looked at it, it was peer reviewed, and we thought it would be successful and it's a best practice. But where do those best practices come from? Generally, it's something that emerged from a community who was working hard on an issue. So in Syracuse, they said, we need to look at what's the right time to get someone in this program in order for it to be effective. And when they found that out, they pushed it out to everyone. So in Flint, one of our measures is the percentage of children who enroll by age two, right? Because we know if we can get three years of enrollment in the Imagination Library, then we can see, uh, so we can see strong outcomes. That's a best practice that was developed from Syracuse. What we want to be able to do through Flint Kids Reads as well is validate local practices or emerging practices and then share those as well. You have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Chad Waldron, and I don't see him uh, in the room, but you'll, see, you'll hear from Dr. Chad Waldron on tomorrow, and he uh, is recently uh, new to the University of Michigan Flint, but he's leading our data conversation on really what are the emerging practices um, in engaging families um, around two generational efforts using the imagination library. So again, if you don't have a contribution, you shouldn't be in the room. So what is the role of each individual partner? All partners have to, have to articulate their contribution or contributions to the scaled enrollment of the Imagination Library and share performance data or continuous improvement. So we ask our, we know that we're looking at 9,500 XNX children, right? And we know that in the next couple of years, we need to be at 50% of those. We started organic enrollments in October and we're at about 2,500 right now, right? But now we're really formalizing toward full implementation. We have to, have, we have to ask our partners on that quarterly basis, how many children can we expect that you are intentionally targeting to get into this system, right? And then we want to know when they get there. If, you, if, if a nonprofit or a church said, we're going to get 10 kids, and they come back and they have three, we want to know what happened that was a barrier to you getting your 10. Was, is, the, is the program overwhelming? Are parents not receptive? Where do you understand it? Because the, uh, Jenny, what did you say? You said that data, that, uh, data in collaboration is for proof, and data in collective impact is for improvement, right? When we're asking our partners for data, we want this to be the best version of our program every time we go out. So a partner's finding that when people get the brochure, they don't necessarily connect it with free books, right? This is something that, we're, that we've heard quite a bit. So in our upcoming meetings, we're talking, we're using that data to have conversations about how we translate the, uh, the, the communication power of the material to make this more effective for our community. 
Partners also had to agree to implementing at least one two-generational activity focused on parents as their child's teacher using Dolly Parton Imagination Library resources. We have a director of programs at our backbone organization that works really closely with each of our individual providers. But we do not want any provider in our coalition professing to have a support for children and not having clear supports for parents. Right? So that's a commitment that we ask any partner of the Imagination Library Fund Kids Read to support. And then lastly, we want to integrate uh, Imagination Library and Plant Kids Read resources into regular partner practice. So if you're running a summer program and you're a partner, um, how are you using the Imagination Library to increase literacy support? So this is really the frame, and I adopted this from the Tamarack uh, Institute, and this, it's a uh, presentation on uh, the effectiveness of backbone organization. But this structure really does reflect where we are in our book rich environments. So as a coalition, we have a steering committee that is made up of individual partners, and the steering committee really provides the strategic guidance for our backbone organization. But in the bubble, let's just talk about the bubble. The bubble in this context is book rich environments, right? Every partner in that bubble is a partner who has made a commitment or their work individually is to increase the percentage of Flint children accessing age appropriate books. Now you see that there are work groups within that bubble. Us, one work group might be barbershop books. I told you about that initially. There's a group of partners working on that. Another work group might be Flint Kids Read. We're talk we talked about that. Another work group might be the Parent Caregiver Workshops. And so they're connected in that way. But then you see outside of that, there are partners who are just out there individually or connected with other partners, but are also contributing to the turning of that curve. So what we're saying is that, on a, in a collaborative way, the Imagination Library will substantially help us to increase the percentage of Flint children accessing age appropriate books. But the individual efforts of our partners, collectively, will guarantee that we'll be able to hit that 100% of Flint children accessing age appropriate books. And the further we go into our work in providing clarity, scope, which is <laughs> As we go further in our work in getting clarity on its components, on scope, which is <laughs> absolutely, we can begin to start having conversations about scale, which is <laughs> <laughs> when we really get clarity around our work, we're able to really start defining what the big picture is and see that we want all of our children to be supported through uh, book rich environments. We believe that we can get that with high quality parent education and quality early learning that they're likely to enter kindergarten ready. So now we have the scope. So now we know scale. We're talking about 9,500 XX kids, and we need to get there through the collective commitment of everyone. When you hear a community say that they have 13,000, 14,000 people enrolled in the initiative, it's not the local champion that is enrolled thousands of people, but it's really looking at this space, your ecosystem of community partners, and really finding out who are those who have a role to play in making a difference, and getting them to the task of making a difference. Uh, again, the Literacy Network, we're the backbone organization for the, for the initiative, and you can find more about Flint Kids Read at fpl.info slash imagination. So thank you all so much, and I'm really excited to uh, open the floor for uh, questions. Questions? Yes, for uh, either uh, Jenny or uh, myself. Well, I have two questions for Jenny. When you're talking about using popular kids, you want us to stand up here. Okay. When you were talking about using popular kids shows as the yes. center, are there copyright issues? Are you getting permission from people in order to hold these events? Oh, absolutely. We we have to, but we get because we partner closely with our public television stations. They help us with the, those connections, but there's a cost to that. That's why I need sponsors to underwrite. So when we bring Daniel Tiger, um, we have to pay for Daniel Tiger. And we bring staff to Mumbles, we, we have to pay for all that. So that's why that becomes a great opportunity for a sponsor to underwrite the cost of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the 
third row. That's okay. If, if um, as a as an affiliate site, we're interested in forming a new partnership, what are the if you had to distill your process down to three steps? What three steps would you take? Or first three steps to build a partnership. <laughs> So first I would identify who are those who are already working on the issue and are already committed to it. I would start there. Um, after that, I would probably try to identify what is the collective. So we know that, so what's the group of people who are working on work rich environments, for example? Secondly, where are they working within the scope of the rich environment? And then how can we move that piece of work that they're already doing <coughs> with the mind that we're looking to expand the coalition as them? Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tag team with you any day. Looks <laughs> like we have one way in, in the back there. <coughs> We know they're going to read it. It's like, okay, you really, you don't even want to get the book out, right? And, that, and that's fine. But if we do nothing, is it okay? When you ask people that question, they have to answer them, right? And the answer is no. It's always no. And so what do we propose to do? So what we say in our community all the time is that we're building our muscle. Right now, we're working on the lowest impact measures that we'll probably ever work on in the history of our coalition. How many kids are getting books? What we really want to know is how many kids are being read to three or more times per week by a caring adult. Right? We want to know that, but we know that by getting 100% of our kids getting books, we'll have now a platform to begin, or an entree, into those deeper measures. Um, and so if, if they're saying, how do we know the kids are reading the book? Ask, hey, listen, great question. How will we know the kids are reading the book? Come to the meeting. That's what we're planning about. Right? <laughs> I feel like that question has deeper levels and so we should spend more time on it because it comes back to this morning of many of us here are trying to raise funds. We are not maybe building coalitions around the entire topic, which I love. We have some smaller organizations that we are part of, like we're part of the coalition that you are. But we have to raise funds and that question of how do you know the kids are reading comes up all the time and you made a point of 43% of adults who have literacy problems live in poverty so people who are funding us do want the answer to that question how do you know they're reading and, and then it goes over to the bilingual population how do you know like what are they doing with the books i mean i approach it always with it does not take an understanding of the language to read a child's book you know the pictures have context you can tell a story you can interact over a book without the language but I do wonder, is there some of a really good answer out there about, about people who have low literacy skills effectively using these resources? Because donors do want to know. And 
Our anecdotal evidence is, yes, they do. I am not posing this as a question. But there maybe is a more educated answer that I'm looking for. So we utilize the results-based accountability methodology in all of our measurements. So you heard me reference this uh, slightly that we talked about how much and how well measures, which are really related to our efforts, quantity and quality. But better off is really, really trying to push from our partners. And so when people say, are people reading the books, what they're really asking is, are people really being impacted positively as a result of the program? And that can be demonstrated in a lot of different ways other than the person reading the book. And so we look at, again, the change in behavior, right? The change in attitude, the change in knowledge, the change in circumstance and the change in skills, right? So while we want to know eventually how many people are reading the books, right, or how many people are, how many people are entering kindergarten ready as a result of the book, that's what a lot of donors want to know, right? So what we, we say is that we're working toward kindergarten readiness, but right now what we know is that more families are engaging um, with, with uh, their children through our barbershop books sites, right? And so with, at eight sites, 50 families per site, we're seeing that this is happening here. What we're planning to do next year, right, to get further into the population thing is this, right? That's change of behavior. Look at really what are those short-term outcomes that are that make people better off, that you can really lean on as you're progressively working toward those harder to turn, long-term indicators. Percentage of families reading three or more times per day, percentage of children into kindergarten ready. But also have the support of coalitions that have been contributing to the body of knowledge to say that this change in attitude or this change in, in skill or this change in behavior does, it may not necessarily be causational, but it does strongly correlate with families being better off as a result of the program. So really harness the capacity here, the body of knowledge, and really look in yourselves at what are the ch changes in behavior, attitude, knowledge, and circumstance, and skill. Read this all again. Yep, so it's BACS. <laughs> <laughs> it's BACS, B-A-C-K-S, behavior, attitude, Circumstance, knowledge, and skill. Do you have a trademark? Is that you? No, that's, that's results-based accountability. That's not me at all. <laughs> no, that's just open and, and, and available for everyone. Okay. I also wanted to, to mention that before we had those um, studies that I referenced published, what I had done was I, I had printed out from the website um, the compilation of research that was done. And every time there was something new, that's what I added to my discussions when I talked to funders. Like when Shelby County put out their stuff, I mean, I made so many copies of that work that I was I was counting that as much as I was counting what we're doing. Because as, as Dr. Frank Rizzi will tell us all the time, it's not it's not just our community. It's how what our effort is is adding to this body, this, this growing body of evidence that supports Imagination Library. So I I was always quick to add anyone else's research to whatever conversation I was having um, to funders and to, uh, on an ongoing basis, update our partners about that, um, what, what Shelby County or It was initially research from Hawaii, wasn't there Hawaii had research? And, um, gosh, um, oh, I can't think of a couple of communities, but I used it, I did, I printed out their information and that's what, so that when I would speak to the funders, and you know, you have to make the rounds with funders. You need to be tenacious and go to them all. And I would meet with them periodically and say, okay, there's something new I found from this community. And this is the angle they're looking at. So it is a growing body of evidence um, and research that I think all of us can use. And I love the idea that you're going to have an updated, I believe there's 41 different, that's like extraordinary. Love that. So believe me, I'm gonna print out Forty one so here. So okay, I have in my back pocket I have what our community did. Wonderful. But I'm gonna use forty one. I'm gonna use that over and over again. And print out that information so that when I make my next round of people saying, Hey, I know you all know about what we've done here, but boy, is there a growing body of research nationwide. And here's a list of that. And there's where you get links to that. So if, if we we again, I guess it's it's, it's as I just mentioned, we float our you know, it all floats all of our boats by this growing knowledge. And I just love the idea that you're going to have that available for communities too. Indeed. And just to reinforce what Jenny's saying and perhaps answer your question in, in, in a different way, is there are, there's the research that exists. Uh, Dr. Ritzy has done some of the more rigorous research. Some, something that you can, you'll always get, this is what we touched on earlier, is you'll always get, yeah, but what about our kids? Um, there's some simple things that you can do in your community. If you want to know if the parents are <coughs> enjoying the program, reading more to their kids as a result, how many times are they reading before you start? Ask them. 
right? It's a very simple thing that you can do. It's not a sophisticated piece of research, but you can always reach out to the parents with a very simple questionnaire, ask them, are you reading more to your child as a result of, of you know, your child? Is your child going and getting books and bringing them to you and asking to be read to you? Do they sit down with books themselves and spend time? Ask them, and then you'll have some information on your kids to go along with some of the more rigorous studies that have already been done. Yeah. And, if, and if the kids, if, if, it's, if all that's happening, to answer the question is, how is it not because parents aren't reading books to their kids? And also, you know, we're doing two. We're also now, um, it's an informal way, but we're surveying our, our referral partners too. So, so Kim calls the referral partners twice a year now and talks to them about, and, and, well, what is to touch and face with them? to see if they need more materials, because people change, people retire, so you gotta make sure you get a valid contact. But then talk to them about the program, talk to them about the impact of the program. So we need to keep in touch with those partners to keep them engaged, and, and, and survey them too. So it's, it's, all, it's, it's an ongoing process. <clears throat> Going back to uh, coalition building, um, I have in mind in my small community forming a literacy council. Um, but I wonder, rather than say that, if I could figure out who the stakeholders are that are working with the age groups I'm interested in, just asking them to come and share what they're doing so that at the very least we all know what each other is doing and then uh, go to the next step, which would be, and how can we help each other? Yeah, that's, you know, um, <clears throat> that's what, as, as, I, as I talked about our work with Campaign for Grade Level Reading in those three areas, school readiness, attendance, and um, summer learning, our community has a, a variety of summer programming, and nothing is connected, it's not, it's not really organized, so this fall, I'm going to have, bring together those partners, and to potentially, um, form a network of summer learning. But I'm not even gonna call it, I'm just, we're gonna just share right now, and just meet. But yeah, that's a great way to go about it. Just first, just meet so you know everyone. And then that will hopefully lead to more, lead to a coalition or a council. And one of the, one of the principles of collective impact is, well, one of the conditions is mutually reinforcing activities, right? And so there are some things that, are, that connect those partners together. What you really want to do is find what are the things that connect them and then where's the gap um, in that. If coalitions fill gaps, right? That's all we do. We find the gaps and we fill them so that our partners can be most successful in reaching those long-term goals. Just as a point of... Just as a point uh, about summer reading, your library is the most logical place in the world to start, right? Yeah, they're our main partner. In this. Right. Yeah. So, so what we find in Flint though is that we have a huge faith-based community right out this relates to summer learning. Each of those churches does a vacation Bible school, right? That's a summer program. They're serving children, and so it's, a, it's within the interest of a coalition to make sure that when those children get to that vacation Bible school, they're receiving some similar quality <coughs> when they go to a large provider like the library. That's why those coalitions are so critical, um, because the library will often say we have these resources that we would love to deploy out to a partner site. Um, and it just builds up the capacity for everything. Um, do we have a question uh, over here? Oh, I just wanted to comment on the, the reading piece. It might be good to take an ECE teacher to a meeting with a potential funder, donor, and just share you know, what emerging literacy looks like for zero to three kids. There's a lot more to getting kids ready for print in terms of just having the book available, holding the book the right way, learning how to turn a page, just the curiosity of the process before they ever decode. There's a lot more that happens before that. Sure. So, and so all of those things he just named, we would consider better off measures, right? But if you don't know that those are things you're looking for, it's difficult to say that people are better off because of this. resources available through the foundation that is just, here's a parent survey that you can send out. Here's one already written with these nice questions that <laughs> you know, collect meaningful data and you may modify it as you so choose. Is that one of the resources
resources that we're going to be getting. And then my second one, can y'all tell I'm new, is there, is there a Facebook group for all of y'all? Like, can I just post something to some group somewhere that says, oh, I'd like to start a coalition, or I'd like to start a parent group, I'd like to do this, and we could collectively use each other's knowledge? And so the first question is, yes, that's one of the things that we're working on. One of the challenges that you'll find with it is, um, we can come up with an outline for it, but there's going to be things that you'll want to ask that are very specific to your community. Um, and another thing is, is well, of the 41 that we'll be sharing, some of them are survey-style research, right? So I think there will be a lot of benefit in seeing what other people have asked, rather than providing a template, but we can do both. Um, the second, the answer to the second question about a, a sort of a closed forum mm -hmm. that you were asking, there's not a closed forum. Listserv. There's not a listserv. Listserv. There's not a listserv. We don't have yes. one. It's something that we've entertained in the past. We do have a Facebook page, obviously, Dolly Parton's Education Library. But it's not really a forum so much for affiliates to communicate. Um, the reason we've entertained that in the past, the reason we haven't done it is because um, we're a fairly small team. And we don't, it, it takes a lot to sort of oversee a list serves. We have, we have some United Way folks in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's a tall order, right? You familiar with the list Yeah. But it sure is useful. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> something we would want to do in the house. Um, we'll re we can certainly revisit it. Is this is a list serve something that people yes. can do? Yes. 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 We'll revisit it and check it out. But when we looked at it uh, a couple of years ago, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I think the idea of a list serve is great. And then when we looked into the mechanics, we were like, wow, this is a full time somebody to oversee this. So it's, we have to look at it from that standpoint as well. But I'm certainly happy to revisit it if it's someone something that everyone thinks is would be useful and would like. Jeff, Jeff, is, Jeff, is there, is there uh, something, and I mean, Kim knows this, I just have random people calling me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. I get it. I get the microphone from you. I get the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there a mechanism on the book order system to ask questions, not necessarily to other coalitions, but we can ask questions about it? Whatever you need to. Certainly, there is. It's in the Knowledge Center, you can ask any questions in there, as well as see questions that folks have already posted, and get answers to them. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a uh, uh, frequently asked questions on steroids. Um, but it's not a conversation platform. Is there any? Is there a restriction, or, or is there anything to prevent us from having? Like, I get cards from a lot of these, the folks that are here, and I can make them my Facebook friend and we can exchange ideas without, uh, is that, or is that allowed? Or? You have as many friends as you want. What I would like for it to be, in this case, is like it, Imagination Library friends. And when I'm not smart enough, I, when you talk about lift surge, you're way over my skill level. I know how to use Facebook. So my friends know how to make a sealed group. And that it's only, uh, a closed group on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. And that way, it would, we wouldn't be bearing our dirty laundry for the whole world to see. But I, or even our clean laundry. Whatever. <laughs> but, but a lot of times, it's what we're doing that's good that doesn't get shared. Who uses closed groups on Facebook? Do they work? Yes. yes. Is that some? Is a closed group on Facebook one that we think we might want to do? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Check it out. Librarians love it. Librarians love it. Do you guys use any kind of... How do you communicate with your coalition? Do you use anything like... Do you know closed group on Facebook to communicate with your coalitions? So we use constant contact as a, as a way to communicate broadly. We do have closed groups and Hang on, guys. Hey, excuse me. Hang on. So we do have a closed group in our family literacy strategy where people share out information. Closed group on Facebook? On Facebook, yeah. Um, where, where people are sharing out, but we literally just started that maybe a few months ago. So I really don't know how effective it's been yet. 
but we we are smaller than platforms. Along those same lines, um, uh, right now, I don't think there's a resource library for us, and there's going to be some things put up on the book order system, but can we do a Google Drive where we could put in our surveys and the link could be part of this closed group so only we have access to it, but then we could share you know, surveys and other presentations that work. Is that possible? Yeah. And in that knowledge base that I mentioned, it's, I think we call it Support Central. It has a lot of things in there posted. Yeah, but, we can't put, but that's you yeah, guys yeah. pushing it out, to us, not us putting in. That's, that's correct. Well. I don't use closed groups on Facebook. Can you post things in there? Yeah, if you're a member. You can post a PDF, for example. Yep. Yeah. 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 You can post a link. Yeah. 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 I've never Christy is our regional director, and anytime I have one of these questions, I email Christy and she sends me all this information. So as long if you access your regional director right now, if they have it, I'll give it to you as well. The, the best difference is people have, I get that, but our job is a full immediately and they have a thing. Any other questions for uh, either Jenny or, or myself? <laughs> <laughs>